Hello and welcome to episode three of the Basis Agronomy Matters podcast. My name's Greg Hopkinson, Technical Manager at Basis. This month we're going to be discussing integrated pest management in fruit production. A number of our members are directly involved in fruit. However, I think everyone will find the discussions with this month's guests really interesting and thought provoking. Firstly, we've got Alex Radu, Technical Manager from AgriVista. We'll be talking about integrated pest management in orchards and some exciting new technologies being implemented. We've then got Selchuk Kertev, IPM manager at Certis, who is going to explain how IPM has been used in strawberry production in the UK to help provide us with fresh, healthy British strawberries throughout the year. Please remember to listen through to the end of the podcast where basis professional registered members can find out how to claim one CPD point for listening. So our first guest on this episode of Agronomy Matters is Alex Radu, Fruit Technical Manager at agronomy company AgriVista. So today we're going to talk to Alex about integrated pest management in tree fruit and how we can best utilise new technologies in this sector. So I know it's currently a really busy time for anyone involved in fruit, so we're really thankful for Alex for making the time to talk to us today and welcome to the Agronomy Matters podcast. Hi, so um, hello, hello, Greg, and yeah, thanks again for the invitation to uh, talk on your podcast. Uh, yeah, and, and of course, talk about IPM. We are very passionate uh, about IPM and encouraging beneficials on farm, and we believe that they are key to sustainable, profitable, and environmentally aware uh, food production. That's a that's a great message to to start with. So, so we're sat here with. Can you just give us a bit of an update on the season and how it's gone so far? I have to say that the the 2020 wasn't a very easy season for for um, growers and, and agronomists alike for a number of reasons. In spring, we recorded um, a number of frost events uh, that affected the blossom and um, some young fruitlets um, in in some of the orchards. Um, not, not not everywhere, but um, localized damage. The late spring and the early summer were warmer than average and and fairly dry. During the, the primary scab season, we, we had some very large scab events that resulted in, in quite a few uh, locations with, with scab um, occurrences. So now on, on top of that, towards the end of the season, despite a cooler than average July, we are now recording a year partial coddling uh, generation too, which will also require attention and, and, and control. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a full on season. Yeah, I think we've had, um, I think, like you say, extreme weather conditions has kind of impacted all areas of agriculture this year and, and kind of fruit, I don't think, has been um, able to escape that either. For most of this interview, we're going to be talking about pest control in orchards and you kind of mentioned it there. So what impact has the weather had on on pest pressure? As I yeah, briefly mentioned, um, the weather patterns that we had in spring, so the hail and the frosts, they they did cause some damage to to the flower parts um, and and fruitlets, but some of these fruitlets have still managed to develop. But that is going to result in an increased risk of, of storage rots compared to a, a normal or average year. Those aside, yeah, the, the, as I said, you know, m- most of the important pests, um, the, the life cycle of, of the of the most important pests, aphids and moths. Uh, we'll get like a, a, a proper boost if the um, w- weather conditions are, are, are favourable, if, if, it's, if it's nice and warm. So, well, obviously that, that makes control a bit more challenging than in, uh, on a normal season. Yeah, that's, that's great. And today, like, you, like we said at the start, we're going to focus on integrated pest management. And it's a term we hear all the time and we're always told we need to focus on it more and more. But just in just to you, in terms of pest control in orchards, what does integrated pest management actually mean? Well, IPM, or integrated pest management, uh, I think it's it's a mindset, it's a holistic approach to farm management that I think above all things should em- embraces the fact that orchards are established in a natural habitat and they are part of the environment. I, I think that. You know, a, a, a true IPM approach focuses on the integration of, of the crop in the surrounding habitat and working together with, with the habitat, with the, with the area, in, in order to achieve a good tree establishment, tree growth, and a sustainable and, and profitable production. And 
a, a sound IPM approach should should start from you know making sure that you you maintain and improve soil health and, and biodiversity because for you know it, it has a very important role in supporting the tree's health and then you know the, the strategies to move on and, and encourage and maintain good levels of beneficial insects by creating attractive habitats for them in the orchards such as grass strips and flower strips in between the rows and flower banks in, in installing refuges and and so on and it's it's very important to um, adopt you know cultural control practices as well in order to mitigate the risks of, of um, our outbreaks for, of, of, of most common pests and diseases. So, you know, the typically growers know of, of, all, these, uh, of all these strategies. They address humidity control and, and fertilizer use, compost mulching, crop hygiene, insect netting, and, and so on. And the, the cherry on the top is, I think, when it comes to the IPM approach, is thorough crop monitoring and checking for regularly checking for for pest and disease development on on farms making use of pest and disease prediction models which which are available for quite a few and nowadays for quite a few important pests and, and diseases and according to to these use initially if possible biological and phys physical means uh, methods of control pnd where where these are suitable and lastly as, as a last resort to use PPP products and use these only where and where and when required. So apply targeted, make targeted applications, and with a view to, to minimize the, the negative effects on non-target species. And of course, making sure that you, you, you know these products are used according to to FRAC to to IRAC and the the, the product the, the manufacturer re re recommendations such. So I think IPM is so this this broad approach, starting from 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 the basics up to the the last you know level of, of controlling addressing the, the the pest and disease issues issues on farm. I think that's a really interesting view on it, and I think it's something that all our members and um, areas of agriculture it's a similar perspective. It works the same across all sectors. I think really. So we're just going to get a bit more into this, some more specifics. We're going to talk about codling moth and tortrix moths today. They're key pests in apples. And this year, how what's the pressure been like for these specific pests? Well, I, I would say the first generation of, of, of codling, um, I think it, the numbers, the levels were, were typical, uh, in, in, more or less in line with the historical numbers. But on, on some of the sites, the, the catches recorded for the second generation were, were very high indeed. So um, if you, you think that the threshold now is, is three codling moth um, male adults caught in a pheromone trap per week uh, on some farms, on some sites, um, th th we had catches of 30 and, and up to 50, 50 moths in, per week. So the pressure was certainly high and pro pro partly probably due to the, to the weather conditions we had earlier in, this, in the season. And in the past quite a few years actually already it, 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 this is the common trend to, to get a, a, a first generation and a, a partial second and in some years when when temperatures when are, are high enough you can actually get a, a, a full second generation in the summer as well now that's that's on on, on some of the farms um, others where cuddling moth control on, on their farm and in the area was was good enough the the partial second generation doesn't doesn't require treating at all because threshold wasn't reached and saying that you know a, a few farms that use the the pheromone disruption systems available uh, the rack three and four where the system was successful in in, in controlling the, the first generation typically the the second one also uh, also is controlled quite well and um, w when used year on year the background population is is also gradually reduced and, and the pressure typically it 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 drops it it gradually drops yeah so we're going to move on to the pheromone disruptors um kind of in a second but just first as a bit of background for people who might not know as much about um controlling these pests how would we they how would they have been traditionally controlled i think that yeah tr traditionally um growers used to to install pheromone uh, delta traps in in the orchards 
and monitor the the the, the catches the, the you know they, 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 these pheromone traps they they um, they emit female pheromones so they attract males and growers used to monitor the the, the catches and traditionally the, the the rule was when one threshold was reached to, to make an application something like about 10, 10 days later and that resulted in a multiple insecticide application um, in, in a season however uh, about I would say maybe about a, a give or take about a decade ago we introduced GCI on, to, to, to um, uh, as a platform Grows Choice Interactive which is based on on RIMPRO model and this model has a, a number of a number of um, different uh, smaller packs and, and one of them is the Codling Moth uh, model and that one based on temperature accumulation will forecast the activity of the female moths. Now, the, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, the, the male moths will start their activity about 10, 14 days, sometimes uh, uh, earlier than, than the females. Um, now, once the females become active, then mating has to happen, then egg laying. And following that, after about seven, 10 days, the larvae actually hatch. So that's actually the optimum time of making the application. And we, we noticed that by, by using this prediction model, the, the coddling moth activity model, instead of just the pheromone traps, so using the two in conjunction, we typically manage to save a, a one application for coddling moth control, so we don't need to, to waste any, any product and, and then have some, you know, potentially, you know, a, a higher expense and, and uh, control of non-target species that's, that's not required. Uh, so that, that's that's how the the, the PPP approach um, developed in, in the past few years, and uh, as, as I briefly mentioned a bit earlier, in, in the past uh, yeah a few years ago, we organised trials and um, we were instrumental in introducing the the RAC three and four pheromone system from BASF in the UK. Agrivista and, and BASF organized a number of trials, and and um, we, we we launched the, the product together. And we're we're supporting it, and it's it's a it's a fantastic IPM tool. is is a great system that basically creates like a female pheromone blanket over the orchards, so basically prevents the males from finding the females and 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 to mate. So this system we we know that is is going to to get an upgrade hopefully soon enough, and I'm I'm convinced that in in the future we'll we'll gradually move on towards towards less and less applications um, as such for, for, for controlling pests and diseases. No, that's a, a really interesting IPM strategy there. So we just spoke there that pheromone disruptors, they kind of prevent um, kind of breeding between the, the males and the females. But there must be a specific way you have to implement this. Have you got any top tips for how this kind of control strategy um, should be used in orchards? Yes, well, one, thing, one thing we've learned since, uh, since introducing the RAC systems in, in the UK is that the, if, the, if the weather conditions are, are suitable uh, and if the, 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 the pressure on site is, let's say, normal, then the system will give you, a, well, 100% control virtually. I mean, in Europe, to put things into perspective, they, they've got three, four generations in, in parts of Europe of coddling moth. And their, in, in, the, their, their experience in the past when, when only chemical control was available was that despite using a, a full program, they still ended up having coddling damage. Uh, now, the pressure is a lot, is a lot lower for, for us here. But in, in, in Europe, when, when they started adopting the, the pheromone disruption systems, they realized soon that using that together with um, um, just occasional applications, targeted applications of coddling, they were getting very good coddling moth control. Now, uh, because the, the pressure is a bit lower here, we hope and, and, and expect in a way the system to, to perform a bit better, but it does have its limitation as, as most of these new systems do. And the most important one is basically a disruption, either a disruption of the of the pheromone blanket as such. So if the you know if you you end up having significant winds or strong strong winds on on the farm during the mating periods, then the pheromone blanket is going to be disrupted and males are going to be able to find females. And once mating happens, females um, well they they're not bothered about the pheromone blanket as such. So they will lay the eggs in in the orchard. 
and another possible scenario is just a basically an influx from adjacent orchards with if they are conventional or from derelict orchards if they're in the area an influx of mated females into into your into your your rack treated site so the, the most important thing i would say when when you, you consider using this is again make sure that you assess the the area um very well and assess the, the site in detail make sure that um of course you, you apply these ampules and disseminate them in the orchards adequately in order to create a, an even spread of the pheromone blanket and also um, make sure that the, the borders are, are, are doubled up to, to, to reinforce the, the, the pheromone cover. And uh, uh, again, uh, an, an advice and a, a strong recommendation from both manufacturers and, and agronomists alike is to continue monitoring, so using these delta pheromone traps to see if if you catch threshold that means that the pheromone blanket obviously was was in uh, in affected for a short period of time and then um yeah just just make an application to in order to achieve control no that's really interesting it sounds like a really interesting um strategy going back to kind of ipm for a lot of arable agronomists kind of controlling pests through ipm is a lot thinking about reducing insecticide sprays to promote beneficials, beetle banks, wild flower margins, and kind of bigger scale landscape management rather than kind of um, product based like the um, pheromone disruptors. Is this landscape management also an important part of IPM in orchards? It certainly is. There, there's no doubt about it. And uh, the, the, our advantage is that we, we've got grass strips in between the tree rows or, or uh, we can actually be proactive and, and have some flower mixes in between these rows. So that's, well, I, I'm, I'm sure we, you know, we create a perfect habitat for, for pollinators, for beneficial predators. So uh, are they, the, the biggest problem for most beneficials in, in, uh, on farms is continuity of, of food uh, and, and uh, adequate habitat. Um, so by regularly mowing, by having a, a bare ground um, and, 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 um, and practices that, that basically either um, uh, eliminate the, 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 the food source or the habitat of these beneficials, then they, they certainly uh, are, are not going to be able to thrive, they're not going to be able to establish. So, you know, the, the, uh, there's, there's been um, numerous trials with, with flower mixes um, and, and um, they, they clearly show that if the, um, if, if the environment is, is suited for encouraging beneficial and, and sustaining their, their, their development and, and, and growth, then uh, they're, they're happy to, to establish in, in orchards. And if the product applications also are, you know, are, are targeted, then they they will certainly help contain and and help control some of the um, pests and diseases we, we, we've got on farm. So just to expand on beneficials, I know another exciting new technology um, you've been looking at is the insect refuges um, in orchards. So can you just explain a bit about what they are, how they work, and and what kind of benefits they bring? Yes, the, the, the wig nests are, are really an exciting, uh, an exciting product uh, and they are basically a development of a, um, an Innovate UK project we were involved with a few years ago, together with uh, EMR uh, and Russell IPM and, and a number of, of other uh, collaborators. The, the principle goes back to pretty much what I just said a few seconds ago. Uh, the you know, beneficials are happy to, and, and they thrive in orchards if they have food source and habitat, you know, if, if, they, if they find shelter and food. And this is basically what, what wig nests are. They, they're, they're a little refuge that will offer protection for, for beneficials. And also, it, it, this it, it comes preloaded with some some earwig food um, with, with some some uh, some nutrition for them, because ear, earwigs will will be happy to to control insect pests. But sometimes um, in, in in orchards, we are very good at at, at controlling insect pests. So there, there are times during the season when when they don't find sufficient food to to you know feed themselves, and also early spring, the, the 
the mothers, the, the, the you know, female uh, earwigs, they actually forage for food in, in, in the, the, on the tree canopy and, and they take food to, to their youngs in, in the nests in the ground. And they are actually the, the, the only insects that, that care for their young, so they're, they're, they're fascinating things. But, and, and this, the, the, the wig nests, are, you know, they're easily installed and, and what the, 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 the trials conducted by EMR and Russell IPM, what they, what they showed was that, the, the, yeah, the refugees will harbour earwig, but also a number of other species like the ladybirds and various numbers of spiders and, and different species of spiders and, and lacewings and anthocorids and, and a number of others. So having a, a good biodiversity and, and good levels of beneficial predators, obviously, will, is, is, it does have an impact on a number of, uh, of pest species, species that otherwise we, we, we may struggle with. So you say you did some trials. So the trials showed, <laughs> an in, when you use the refuges, an increase in beneficials and a decrease in pests. Was that yes? Show? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, in in a nutshell, yes. That, that's what the trials showed. And Michelle Fountain presented presented the results last year when we were still able to uh, to have uh, uh, um, meetings. <laughs> Whereas, and I'm I'm sure that the, the the results of the of the trials can can be made available. But yeah, the 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 introduction of, of you know, flower strips and the introduction of, of refugees, they'll certainly enhance the biodiversity and the numbers of beneficials in the, or in the orchard. So, you know, pollinators, predators, paras- parasitoids and, and parasitic wasps. And so they, they, they will help contain a, a pest outbreaks and, and be, be before they actually take place. Or once, once the, the levels build up, they, they help, con, con, uh, again, contain the levels. Yeah, that's really interesting and a really great thing that um, there's research going on. Find innovative new ways like this to control pests. It's, um, it's really exciting. So I've got one final question um, today, and it's a bit more general about the fruit market. So there's a lot of pressure by end markets at the minute to kind of produce residue-free food, um, especially for fruit and vegetables. Um, yeah. Do you think this is achievable? And um, if we want to still maintain the current quality standards we've got? Right. Uh, f- first of all, I think we, we've got to mention that in, in the UK, we operate in a, in a very professional industry where strict legislation on, on product use, harvest interval requirements, basically help, help, help us provide the UK consumer with some of the best fruit and highest standard fruit available globally. It's it's well known that you know the the, the fruit residues uh, from from locally produced from British fruit is, is significantly lower lower number of residues on, on compared to European or um, other international producers. Now I'm I'm convinced that we will continue to work with all these technologies and and, and taking a holistic approach to to crop health to ensure that we maintain and potentially, you know, f- continuously improve the, these standards. However, in, you know, just in, in answer to your question, fruit that is, that is residue free is being produced already by, by some farms, but it's worth mentioning that the, the weather patterns and of the, the effect that they have directly on the pest and disease development they will influence the, the production and, and could affect the yields as well as the production costs. But as I said, you know, in a nutshell, residue-free fruit is, is being produced and, and most, most growers certainly are trying to, to reduce their applications as, as much as possible nowadays. That's been um, really interesting, Alex. And like I say, just want to say thanks again for uh, joining us on the Agronomy Matters podcast. No, no problem at all. It was a pleasure. As I said, you know, we, we, we love talking about IPM and um, we're, we're, we're happy to, to, um, to discuss with anyone for, for any further details and information. And um, yeah, just, just, just get in touch. Don't hesitate, please. That's great. Thanks very much. So our second guest on this episode of Agronomy Matters is Selchuk Kirtev, IPM manager at Certis UK, who provide a wide range of crop protection products for the UK fruit market. CMO has a passion for sustainable agriculture and integrated pest management. Today, we are specifically going to discuss how we can produce British strawberries in a sustainable way for the UK market. So thanks for agreeing to speak to us today, CMO, and welcome to the Agronomy Matters podcast. 
Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to take part in this podcast. You're more than welcome. So let's start just talking about the British strawberry. It's a bit of a hallmark of summertime in the UK, but how we actually produce strawberries in the UK has changed quite a lot over recent times. Can you just give us a bit of a brief overview of how strawberries were traditionally grown and then how this has changed over time? Okay, well, um, traditionally, we have grown UK strawberries in open fields in, and single rows in soil on a three, five year cycle back in the 70s and 80s, with many commercially grown strawberries being available through roadside pick your own businesses and being sort of commercially harvested for local markets during the strawberry season as we knew it. Some of these pick your own businesses actually still exist and are part of our landscape and heritage now, which is great. Since then, we have changed three fundamental parts of strawberry production. The growing medium we grow them in, how we grow them, outdoor, tunnel, or glasshouse, and of course, the varieties we grow. So medium, method, and variety are the three biggest changes that we've made. In terms of medium, we gradually moved from soil into coir bags or uh, effectively a substrate. Initially, we grew them on raised beds and then we moved on to what we call tabletops. In terms of method, growers and the market started to gradually look to extend the season of strawberries by planting under tunnels, which can be covered and uncovered to control the environment and even into glass houses subsequently to grow fruit outside of the seasons. And the third sort of significant change that we've made over the last few years, uh, it comes with varieties. In the 90s, UK bred Everbearer varieties by by East Morning were released and um, variety like Calypso and Bolero were quite successful. And then subsequently later in the 2000s, a variety was an Everbearer variety was, was released in 2000s. And all these were starting to shape the future of strawberry production. These are day neutral strawberries and were first discovered back in the 50s, I believe, or possibly even earlier in the States and Japan, which effectively means that the strawberry will continue to produce flower and fruit throughout the season, providing that we have the relevant uh, environmental conditions. In the UK, we really started to embrace these innovative production techniques in the 2000s. And as as a nation, have developed different taste buds for UK strawberries, which has led us to further varietal improvements. That's probably the shortest I can I can explain the production and the, the, the way that we've changed producing strawberries in the UK. No, that's great. I think that's a great kind of introduction. And obviously, over the last 20 or 30 years, it sounds like there's been a lot of change. One of the things that's definitely changed is kind of the seasonality um, of it. Like you said, British strawberries were already kind of tightly bound to UK summer and kind of events like Wimbledon. But we can now get strawberries, like I say, for eight to nine months of the year. So I'm guessing variety has obviously played a role in that, like you said. But is there anything else that's kind of made this possible? Yes, I think the... the extension of the season has been a revelation for UK growers and according to the latest horticultural statistics uh, back in 1985 a year after I was born we actually produced 50,000 tons of strawberries and provisional statistics for last year as a comparison we're now tipping over 141,000 tons of UK grown strawberries so you can see how significant these recent changes that we've went through have impacted the uh, extension of the season itself and the supply of British strawberries. This is possible because, as you said, we've actually adopted these varieties, everbearers as well as traditional June bearer varieties, and we've combined them and fine-tuned them in parallel with ta- tabletop production. And let's not forget the investment that the industry has made in terms of research for better understanding on how to maximise yields has been significant in the last five or six years. 
I think also very often we, we change our perception on, on what we eat and when we eat them in terms of season. We often have perception that June strawberry tastes better than the one in April or September. Although sometimes this is true because of the variety that we grow changes through the year. It's also assisted by the various taste parameters like brick levels in fruit, fruit firmness, etc. Nine times out of ten, we don't get the best from our punnet of strawberries at home by wrongly storing them in the fridge rather than keeping them on the windowsill and consuming them uh, immediately. So they are a fresh produce, they are delicious fruit, and it should be enjoyed as soon as they arrive. So although seasonal strawberry is great, I see absolutely no difference in terms of the value of the fresh produce outside of season two. That's great. Some, some good food storage and, and shopping tips there as well thrown in. That's, that's really interesting. So we are always told to eat a bit more seasonally then. And there's a lot of talk on social media, things about intuitive eating and kind of trying to eat with the seasons. So do you think the extended strawberry season is a positive or should consumers become more comfortable with this seasonal eating? I, th- I think the extension of the season is, is, is really positive, not just from diet side of, or point of view, but also from economical impact to, to us as consumers and, and also the wider community in the UK. And let's not forget, it's, it's a part of a industry which contributes to the UK economy greatly. And I think it's, it, it can only be a positive. That's great. So maybe something a bit more negative now slightly. So with all areas of agriculture, we continue to lose key active ingredients and there's even tight to restrictions on the actives that do remain. Can you just highlight some of the key pesticides we've lost from strawberries over the last few years? Okay, well, this is a very wide subject, actually. Over the sort of years, we have changed our production te- techniques in strawberries, as I've mentioned earlier. So some of the the products were very useful, actually, because we've changed from, for example, from soil into growing banks, some products just naturally became abandoned and others were very effective and very useful and were withdrawn. So a few active ingredients come to mind, like chlorpyrifos, benpropimol, fosetal aluminium, really big active ingredient for retco or or, um, crown rot control some more sort of herbicides uh, like uh, uh, glyphosinate ammonium for example uh, are also in in that list and more recently restriction on on abamectin and the the fact that tyrocloprid is now going so there are quite a big number of these active ingredients that we have we, we have lost and or losing But remember, despite these losses, the industry is continuing to invest to bring new products to replace those which are lost. And although we have to invest greater amount of funds and resource to discover that new active, we're still looking to bring those conventional chemistry because they are part of integrated pest management. Definitely. that, And that's great to hear that we're still trying to bring new products to market for crops, the slightly more niche crops like strawberries. So, but with this loss of actives, there must be some different kind of IPM methods being utilised to control pests and weeds and diseases so we can maintain the high quality product that UK strawberries are. I think on 26th of November 2015 is actually a date very close to when I started at Certis. So on that day, 26th of November 2015, in the UK, we set to adopt and implement the Sustainable Use Directive under the National Action Plan, which highlighted the need for the sustainable use of pesticides and their implementation in crop production. One of the key areas in the National Action Plans is the Integrated Pest Management, or IPM in short. And the legal requirement for these IPM plans to be demonstrated in the field and their adoption as part of the Sustainable Use Directive. So growers have turned their focus on the principles of IPM, which are broadly described in what we call the IPM pyramid, starting with cultural controls and monitoring, physical control and biological control, and biopesticides 
and conventional chemistry as the last option. So again, the industry is continuing to search for and develop new products, particularly by pesticides, to support the growing knowledge base of integrated pest management production methods. That's really interesting. My next question was actually just going to be on biopesticides. Obviously, they are slightly different to conventional chemistry. So do they have to be used in a different way? And, and what are your key tips to kind of maximise their effectiveness? Biopesticides are not something new. Um, these were actually discovered and used back in the 1800s. I think their adoption has only started to gain uh, real traction in the last 10, possibly 20 years. Now, some of these were a little bit earlier, of course, particularly in the glasshouse crops. But the broader sense of, of biopesticides really started being adopted in, in, in the last 10 to 20 years. Often they're very specific and require significant attention to detail to get the most out of them, which is challenging as, as, as growers have already uh, an, an overload of physical and psychological daily tasks to deal with in, their, in the way they grow strawberries. It is very intensive production, so you can imagine a high-value crop and, and the sort of tasks that you need to deal with day in, day out. I think, in addition, the performance of these biopesticides can often be lower than the conventional chemistry, and, of course, they cost more. However, their benefits, uh, once farmers understand them, can be significant such as lower risk of resistance, better pesticide residue management in the fresh produce, indirect benefit to the workplace environment, which is becoming even more important than some of these mentioned earlier. And of course, they do have indirect benefit to the natural habitats of non-target organisms, which have a significant impact on natural pest control in and outside of the crop. I think also they often have shorter harvest intervals, allowing crops to be protected right up to harvest so your strawberry reach you in tip-top conditions on the supermarket shelves or in the market. I think that's probably uh, what I can say in, in terms of uh, the biopesticides and, and what they brought to the market. No, that's really interesting. And and obviously biopesticides come in a lot of different forms. And one area which is becoming kind of increasingly important is macrobials. And while these are generally associated with glasshouse crops, can you just explain how they can be used in a strawberry crop and, and how it can maximise the benefits of them? When we talk about macrobials, we, what we really mean is, is we're talking about insects which predate or are parasitic to the pest and are artificially introduced into, into our crops, particularly in this case, as we talk about strawberries. They are a very effective control option as the target pest cannot avoid them easily. It's, 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 it's that relationship between a predator and a prey. You know, you, you can run, but you don't always can hide. So um, that's why they're so effective, provided that good establishment of these macrobials is achieved. In tunnel crops of strawberries, the use of, of these microbials can start as early as, as March, depending, of course, on geographical location. Most of the microbials are released manu manually by seasonal staff, and with the increase in labour costs, many growers are now moving to mechanical distribution, which is great, as the timing of the release of these microbials is very important to get the best out of them. And of course, cost saving too. Introduction of microbials has become much more widely uh, used in, in strawberries in the last, last five, possibly 10 years maximum. Uh, and it is mainly practiced on, on sort of tunnel and glasshouse crops with very little, if anything, on, on outdoor crops. And there are some variations in terms of 60 day strawberry in comparison to ever bearers. The key in the success with the microbials is to start their integration in the program early and adopt meticulous monitoring throughout the season. The recommended introduction rates by the agronomists and the microbial suppliers should be strictly followed. Again, don't cut corners and most importantly, 
pay attention to compatibilities with insecticides and fungicides in order to reduce any adverse impacts on population levels. That's a yeah, really good tip and really interesting. It's an area I don't know a lot about myself, really. But just looking at IPM from a kind of different viewpoint, when we think about it in broad acre agriculture, arable crops, which is kind of where my background is, we're generally thinking about things like beetle banks and wildflower margins and more large scale landscape features. Does this play any kind of role in the IPM strategies for soft fruits and things like strawberries? Yes, indeed. And a good example can be the attention to detail we, together with the strawberry growers, we pay to, to our hedgerows when it comes down to monitoring, for example, for the spotted wing drosophila and also more niche pests like capsids. However, the intensity of pest dynamics and their control in strawberries with a shorter life cycle is much faster by many folds making it much more intense than some of the broad acre crops. That's why strawberry growers have much shorter time for intervention, so uh, timing is really crucial. However, IPM is equally important in broad acre crops, and it is not just agri-environment features. The basic principles we have already touched upon, um, like the cultural control varieties, etc., planting times, which fields are most susceptible? Do you have varieties that are really susceptible, etc.? These all apply to, to broad acre crops, with the chemical control being the final option when everything else has been explored. So the principles are the same, however strawberry production is very intensive so the time for intervention is is much shorter definitely that's it's been really interesting talking about like I said, horticulture and fruit production isn't an area i know i particularly come from i'm from arable but actually talking about ipm it's the same theory and the same principles whether you'd like to say whether you're applying it to a strawberry crop or to a field of wheat really one area that is probably slightly different is that obviously Crops like strawberries are fresh produce. They're going directly to consumers and they're, they're eating that product directly. So obviously that makes residues become more important. And there's been quite a lot in the press and supermarkets saying they're trying to aim to supply residue-free products, especially fruit and vegetables, in the near future. Do you think this will be possible with a British strawberry to produce a residue-free product? We know we can. As some growers and marketing groups in the UK have already demonstrated this in the past and we continue to do so where we can too. However, the biggest challenge is the educational part in any sustainable production. We need to provide education to the whole industry starting from the consumer and retailer where growers delivering such high quality, residue free, sustainable fresh produce is rewarded accordingly and the consumer are prepared to pay for the purchase and, and their produce. Let's also remember that just because a residue is detected, it does not mean it is a bad thing. This is why we have MRLs based on the gap for correct product use. We have to produce the, the products outside of the, the, their seasonality. But as I said, we also have to help educate on what safe, sustainable food is and how it is produced. And I think British growers have certainly done that. Just we need to do a little bit more on the educational front, I believe. What a really positive message, I think, that we can get out there, which is great. And then the final question I'm going to cover, it's, a, it's another kind of topical area, is greenhouse gas emissions and kind of carbon footprint. Obviously, this is becoming more and more focused in the media and the general public. And the strawberry production, as you said, has become more intensive and less seasonal. Do you see like energy usage and carbon footprint being an issue in the future? And how can we counteract this? OK, well, British growers have managed to provide supply of British strawberries to the UK and, and reduce imports significantly in the last few years. Uh, we've touched on this moving from sort of June, July, traditional strawberry to now eight to nine months of supply. I think. In addition, we're continuing to innovate in the reduction of inputs of fertilizers, water and crop product protection products through important research, which many UK research facilities are carrying out. 
We are seeing the adoption of new technologies which benefit both the environment and the grower, such as LED lighting, for example, or drip and trickle irrigation, growing environment monitoring systems and biofuels too. It's part of the bigger need, I believe, and, and desire by the society at large to move to more environmentally sustainable production method in not only food production. And let's not forget, imports also do come with a carbon footprint and food miles. So like anything, a balance has to be reached. Finally, I'm, I'm proud and, and very much behind our British growers and we will continue to support here at Certis in the UK um, as, as much as we can. I believe the more we fulfill the British demand of strawberries with British food, I think some of the points that you've made in your questions are probably less relevant as we achieve a better balance of import-export. Well, thanks, Simo, for joining us. And I think that's a really positive message to end on. That's been really interesting to learn all about the innovations that are taking place and kind of the change that have happened over the recent years. So, yeah, thanks again for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of Agronomy Matters. And thanks again to our two guests today. If any of our members are looking for ways to improve their knowledge and gain CPD points from home, then please log in to the BASIS classroom. All members of the professional register should have received their unique login details to access this online portal of CPD courses. Currently, there are courses available from Adama, Certis, UPL, and for our facts qualified advisors, Origin. These cover a wide range of topics, and upon completing the course, members will get CPD points automatically allocated to their account. For those members particularly interested in fruit, Please remember Fruit Focus Live is taking place online on the 9th and 10th of September. There will be a range of seminars and information available via the Fruit Focus website with basis CPD points available. For our members to receive a CPD point for listening to this episode of Agronomy Matters, please log in to the members area on the basis website and select Submit CPD Points. You will then need to put basis podcast Fruit IPM into both the CPD reference number and publication title fields before pressing submit. Thanks again for listening and join us next time on Agronomy Matters.